Uh, it's 4 p.m. Eastern, so I guess we'll get started. Um, welcome, everyone. Thank you for being here with us today for Office Hours. We have a great group. It looks like about 26 participants so far. Uh, I'm Elizabeth Mays with the Rebus community. And at Rebus, we are building a new and collaborative model for open textbook publishing. And we're using our experience with some pilot open textbook projects to inform the development of software and resources to support that process. We've partnered with Open Textbook Network to offer these monthly sessions that are designed to tackle common issues in open textbook creation. And if you aren't already a member of Rebus, we invite you to join us and learn more about what we do at forum.rebus.community. And with that, I'll introduce my co-host, Karen Lauritsen, with the Open Textbook Network, who is joining us by phone. Karen? Hi. Yes, I'm here. Okay, fantastic. I'll let you introduce the Open Textbook Network. Okay, thank you, Liz. So I'm Karen Lauritsen. I'm Managing Director with the Open Textbook Network, and we are delighted to collaborate with Liz and the Rebus team on these monthly conversations so that we can bring together a community of open textbook collaborators and practitioners. For those of you who are not familiar with the Open Textbook Network, we are a community working to improve education through open education. Our members represent more than 600 higher education institutions and together have saved students more than eight and a half million dollars by implementing open ed programs. We currently offer several pathways to support open textbook publishing. These include guides and adaptable resources available to the common good, two of which were made on Rebus. And um, we also offer a Pressbooks EDU sandbox and discount. And we just launched a pilot for the publishing cooperative, which provides infrastructure, training, and support for institutions to launch their own full service open textbook publishing programs. So um, today we're going to be talking about open textbook adaption. And um, I am delighted to introduce our three guests. We are joined by Lori Asoff, who is a manager with the Open Education Program at BC Campus, Dave Dillon, who is a counselor and professor and chair of the OER Task Force, the Academic Senate for California Community Colleges, and he's at Grossmont College, and Anita Walls, who is the Open Education Copyright and Scholarly Communications Librarian at Virginia Tech, and who led the development of our editing guide, um, which is pertinent to our topic today. So um, I will hand it over first to Dave um, to give us a little background. And then from there, we'll go on to Lori and Anita, and then open it up to a conversation and your questions. So please take it away, Dave. Thank you. Can you hear me OK? Yes. OK, thanks for that introduction. I appreciate it. And I'm honored and pleased to be joining you. Um, I hope that what I might say might be helpful to, um, to folks that are looking to either try to put together similar things um, that I helped create or um, help others to do the same. Um, so I was fortunate to be approved for a sabbatical uh, leave in the fall semester. Um, I'm at Grossmont College in San Diego. Uh, I, I work as a counselor and professor, and I ordinarily teach uh, in the college success genre. So I have a, a college and career success course. It's a three-unit course, kind of like a first-year experience um, <clears throat> orient extended orientation to college course. I also teach two one-unit courses, uh, career decision-making and a study skills and time management. And so um, I had previously wrote um, or authored a, a textbook that was at a university press and I had maintained my copyright. Um, I was really sensitive to the cost and had negotiated a cost of under $30 um, only to be very irritated that my own bookstore had marked it up within two years uh, to $42. And so it was about that time that I really started to learn about OER and, and knew that that was the right fit for me. And so when it came time to update and put together a second edition, I had put in for the sabbatical proposal to um, really curate, co-author, and edit um, OERs for each of those courses. And so I began taking a look at my course outline and searching for content that directly matched uh, the course outline. And um, I found two uh, pieces of content that I really liked from Open Oregon, um, one from Lumen Learning, 
one from uh, SUNY, State University of New York, and then I combined or remixed um, the content that I liked from all of those sources with my own original content. Um, I was also fortunate to be able to use a, the least restrictive Creative Commons by license uh, to be able to globally license the whole thing. Um, there was one of those sources that was originally a CC by share alike non-commercial um, and I worked with SUNY to be able to relicense it um, as CC by so it, it just it made it a lot smoother to have everything under the same license. Um, let's see, I, I want to make sure I'm staying under my time allotment. And I think that's, I think that covers most of what I wanted to talk about. I, I, I want to throw a big thank you to Lori, because your, um, let me make sure I have it right. It's the, um, it is the, BC campus. I, I'm going to butcher the title. So I apologize, Lori, but it's how to put together an open textbook. And that was a phenomenal resource for me to be able to use. So I'm, I'm so thankful that that resource existed. Um, and a, a perver or Liz, you may have the, the list of other resources that were helpful. Um, those may appear in the chat. And I'm happy to talk about uh, how they helped me further. Thank you. Thanks, Dave. And I think you gave a great introduction to Lori. So Lori, um, we look forward to hearing about your experience. All right. Well, I'm glad it helped, Dave. And actually, we're getting ready to release a much improved uh, newer version of that with a lot more steps. So glad to hear it's being put into use. Uh, so as Karen mentioned, I'm manager of manager of open education at BC campus and my participation in adaptations is as a project manager working with faculty authors and adapting faculty authors in our province in BC. Um, at the beginning phases of BC campus we undertook the major adaptation of 10 textbooks and the impetus for us was to Canadianize books. So many of the open textbooks, particularly at that time, were American. And even though people sometimes think of us as the 51st state, uh, we do have our own requirements. So uh, I worked on four of those 10 books. And what we did was we asked faculty in our province first to do peer reviews on books that we curated. And then based on their feedback, um, put a call out for targeted adaptations based on the feedback, and then also took uh, suggestions from faculty who wanted to adapt or revise a book that we had in our collection at that time. The second condition was that they would Canadianize the books. And so what this typically meant was replacing the content with Canadian content, Canadian examples, but also we realized the spelling should be Canadian, which is usually uh, partly American, partly British, depending on where you live in the country. And also we use metric measurements, not imperial by and large. So uh, we made those sort of changes. And then as we went through that process, we created a style guide for our, our authors and um, instructed them to create style sheets which were uh, idiosyncratic for their particular book. We were working with a group of copy editors and proofreaders so they helped us to develop those tools and uh, we have since learned that our faculty those books that we adapted have been well used and loved and have been greatly used in the classroom because they do fit the curricula in this province and across the country. Uh, as far as what I have learned was that um, a major adaptation is a huge undertaking. I've been asked several times, how did you do it? Well, uh, one thing I learned is you really have to start with a quality book when you begin and I my husband and I went through many, many home renovations during this period. So I look um, upon a textbook adaptation like a home renovation. Uh, you run into surprises all the time and sometimes it can take just as long as building a new house. So that whole quality thing became very important and where quality would show up would be, for example, are all of the resources, the images, the graphs, the videos in the book openly licensed because those items
do get borrowed and they're uh, very often not uh, new creations as is the text. Um, we found that many books did not follow that best practice and so we made it a point of auditing the books and double checking all the resources. If uh, an item was not openly licensed, we either pulled it uh, and had nothing or we found a replacement. Copy editing was the other big issue. Um, we found many books that either had not been copy edited or were poorly copy edited. So if you can find a book that has gone th through that rigorous phase, uh, all the better. And then as our authors were making changes, we had to decide, uh, did we in fact go back and copy edit the original work or not? Because we wanted a consistency in tone um, the elements that were included in the book and the writing style. Um, and then lastly, let's see how my time is going. Uh, we, it, it was important to see what sort of file types and formats the original book was in. So we did run into cases where a book that people wanted was in a PDF, which is really difficult to edit, of course, and we were putting everything into press books. So sometimes this took a lot of time before the adaptation occurred where we were manually putting it into the book. Uh, we did do a major adaptation of an OpenStax book. That was a lot of work as well because it was difficult to get that book into press books. Um, since then, we have created a plugin that will, we're, it's kind of in beta phase now, which will pull OpenStax books into press books. So we're working on pulling all those books into press books for others to use. Um, yeah, and so there's my five minutes and I'd be happy to answer questions about that. Thanks, Lori. I, I don't think I'm muted, so I'm just gonna keep talking. Um, thank you for sharing your experience and for providing what may be our working metaphor during our conversation, and that is um, that adapting a book may be a bit like a home renovation and starting with quality materials will make all the difference. Um, now I'd like to turn it over to Anita Walls to share her experience. Please take it away, Anita. Thank you, Karen. I want to tell you about a project that I undertook in 2015 with a business faculty member here at Virginia Tech. And uh, I have a lot of details, so I'm just going to um, talk and we can um, hear, hear your questions a little bit later. Um, Professor Skripak in the College of Business was wrestling with options when a new edition of his book, which students weren't reading anyway, escalated to around $220. After many conversations, we decided to remix an openly licensed textbook with several goals in mind. First, that it be openly licensed, that our final output be, that it be a good fit and engaging for students. And for that reason, we decided to involve students at various points in reviewing the text, that it be 508, or um, compliant or otherwise accessible to screen readers, that it be editable, low cost, print on demand. And we also wanted to do a, that's to be a lean process. So we decided to do this in addition to our regular jobs. Uh, and as Lori said, the best analogy to me as well of this type of work as a construction project, you're either building something brand new or you're renovating something that already exists. So in keeping with the construction project analogy, Professor Skripak reduced the text by 40 or 50 percent. He rewrote entire sections and reorganized sections into different chapters. He brought in additional contributors and authors as well as hired and supervised students reviewers. I was responsible for the overall project management and uh, a part of this was to train all of the team members on Creative Commons licenses, copyright, how to write attributions. I think this is an extremely critical contribution that a project manager can make to this type of project. I also was uh, responsible for obtaining grant funds and paying people within a university, which is interesting. Uh, and in keeping with the construction analogy, I reviewed the entire book for copyright issues and, as, and assessed the scope of graphic design and research work that would be required for the book. I handled a couple different permissions issues for content that we couldn't find that was op not openly licensed managed the production, which included obtaining ISBNs, writing a copyright and attribution statement for a remix, and then organizing the front matter. 
the print on demand process is something that I worked on and uh, also established some partnerships for parts of the process that we couldn't handle in house. And then I was a contributor and I don't recommend this for project management managers, but I did research for some of the new chapters and new sections and I updated all of the data in the book. So back to the paradigm of renovation, what we found as sort of as Lori mentioned, the book contained numerous in copyright images that did not have the language used with permission. It had pop culture examples like names of trendy bands or now out of date fashion trends, which needed to be updated. It had a chapter on technology, which Professor Screepack jettisoned entirely knowing it would be out of date in about six months. We did have difficulty finding certain images and that led one contributor to include images under fair use which we talked about and was they were removed. This is a really difficult kind of conversation to have. Uh, and then on the production side, the sort of rebuilding, there were some significant lessons that we learned. I had planned for iterative student feedback throughout the manuscript and layout phases, be, partly because we were using graphic design software, but this meant going through layout twice. And we did that for two chapters and we said no more. Um, accessibility, we wanted the book to be screen reader friendly and after meeting with accessibility experts we learned that producing a book using this type of software would make it beautiful but it would lack structure, it would not be screen reader friendly, there were other sh issues with it, um, including adaptation. We wanted to release the book in something in addition to PDF, something more editable. So without deep knowledge of other tools and with other, without other recommendations, and this is in 2015, we opted for authoring and layout in word processing software. Uh, and since the book was designed to fit an existing curriculum, we didn't plan on creating ancillaries, though this is clearly important based on the number of inquiries that we receive. So we've set up a sharing portal in OER Commons so that adopters can share their ancillaries. We've worked through all of these things and we ended up with Anita, we may have lost you. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yes. Okay. So sorry. We we um, we ended up with a 420-page digital print and digital and print full-color book, which fits the course. It's editable. It has an accessible navigation structure. And as of today, the complete PDF has been downloaded over 57,000 times in about 18 months. So um, the guidance that I would like to offer are uh, a few things. Uh, first, if your role is working with faculty or with authors in uh, writing or adapting, uh, that it's very important to establish very clear goals and a scope of work. It's really easy to let your scope creep. So you refer back to this often and uh, let it guide you. Uh, otherwise, you'll add more work that you didn't plan on doing. Uh, licensing is very important, and I almost left this out, but it's, it's really important to be very clear um, and maybe even in writing regarding what kinds of licenses are acceptable, both as inputs and as outputs. Third thing I would say, plan to learn. Make a plan regarding your process, what you'll use to get there. Have it reviewed by some, by at least one person that has publishing experience and can give you feedback and ideas on your proposed process and your timeline. Uh, make sure you, you and your team members are up to speed regarding technical skills and regarding what's expected. One idea would be to write job descriptions of um, what each person is going to do on the project in order to flesh out those project expectations. The unwritten ones are sometimes really dangerous. Uh, agree on a communication plan for your team. How will you communicate and how often? There are so many surprises that come up. There are lots of uncomfortable moments that come up and the more you can keep the communication lines open the better. Um, almost last two more. Um, one, be willing to say no or not right now. 
if the project is not the right one or this is not the right time, it is okay to say no. Um, so that you can say yes to projects that fit better and yes later when you're ready to take on a bigger project. And then lastly, celebrate and tell other people about your team's accomplishments. Um, remixing books, as you've heard, as well as OER can be challenging, but it's also really rewarding. Thank you. Thanks, Anita. I really appreciate how you highlighted that there are both technical concerns as well as many others like interpersonal and managerial things to keep in mind um, when working with a group of people on a, on a project like this and that sometimes there's an emotional component. <laughs> so um, thank you, Dave, Lori, and Anita. So now is the time for our open conversation. Everyone is welcome to unmute and ask a question that way of any or all of our speakers and guests. Um, or if you prefer in the chat, um, Liz and Aperva have their eye there too. So um, let's, let's start talking. So Jody, thank you for placing that in the chat. Um, Jody's placed an MOU uh, for digital project management um, from UTA librarians uh, and it's openly licensed. There's a toolkit and a template. Thank you, Jody. Um, I see from C. Holland uh, a question. How did you become a project manager uh, for building an open textbook? And how did that conversation begin? I Lori, do you want to yeah. tackle that? Or should yeah, I talk? sure. <laughs> well, I got hired by BC Campus 15 years ago, so I kind of moved into that role. Um, for us, we, we started, as a, started out as a project, and now we call ourselves um, BC Campus Open Education because we've moved beyond open textbooks. But we recognized early on that we're not faculty or post-secondary staff. We were there to uh, support and guide the faculty. So we were trying to, we were learning as we were going in the beginning. And as we move to the next phase of our project, where now we provide OER grants, um, we delegate more. So we move to what we talk about going from hand-holding the project management to handoff uh, and teaching those out in the system how to do this. Uh, we're a very small team. Uh, we get quite a bit done, but we need to teach those who are developing and using these materials and resources how they can do it on their own and it's really interesting now we're just five years into it to see what the institutions are doing it's quite remarkable so i would say regarding uh, project managing and adaptation this was a referral that came from one of my colleagues from a friend of his who was frustrated with his options and wanted to talk and we went through uh, we met a few times and talked about uh, what he wanted to do and uh, decided he looked at several different options and said i like this one the best let's see if we can make this work um, we did not have a lot of structure at that point, uh, and um, there are a lot of things I would do differently. <laughs> okay, so we have a couple questions about technology. Um, Kay Shaughnessy is actually asking, Anita, did you stick with WordPress or did you switch to Pressbooks? And then there is also a question from Brian Hickam on what types of files are most common for OER. Um, he's especially curious about proprietary software. Sure. Um, we actually stuck with Microsoft Word, which I know is a little bit terrifying. <laughs> um, we didn't have the expertise at that point to move to Pressbooks. We didn't have hosting. Um, the faculty member was very comfortable authoring in Word, and there were some accessibility issues um, related to what we had planned to do uh, we just it, it was really early and we didn't have the technical skills and the, the access that we needed to move to something like Pressbooks. But I would not recommend um, layout in Microsoft Word. It's not designed for that and it's very frustrating. <laughs> Fantastic. So Mandy Goodset has a question for things like copy editing or other things librarian team members might not have expertise in. How did you provide that help for faculty? And I think that would be um, for Lori and Anita. 
Uh, for us, we hired, uh, this was part of our budget, so we're publicly funded by the provincial government, and uh, we also get some funding from Hewlett. And so with the budget we provided for each book, we hired professional copy editors, and I would say it was money very well spent because they taught us a lot, and they have eyes that I would give gold for. They see everything, and uh, they they will because they don't aren't experts in each of the subject areas they're copy editing they read like a student would read the book which i learned early on and they could say to the author i don't know what you mean here can you clarify this what do you mean by such and such so that's what we did with the copy editing um or other things librarian members might not have the expertise in uh, again part of it was learning as we go but our particular team and uh at BC campus, we do each have skills that complement each other. And I think the team has naturally grown to include those people. So we, we do have developers and technical support, and then we have individuals on the team who have um, a greater expertise and maybe interest in press books, for example. Uh, I'm the procedural geek. I, I like writing guides and watching, you know, crossing the T's and dotting the I's. So I'm good at recording procedures and documentation. Um, yeah, so anyways, that's how we have managed in our, mm -hmm. in our project. So for this project, we did not hire a copy editor. We had uh, one faculty member who was remixing another faculty who was following after him, a group of students that were, um, giving feedback. Now what we do is for a non-beta kind of release, we will send something out to be copy edited and we will um, hire a professional who can do that. Um, for graphic design, we were able to handle a lot of that in-house. What we found since then with uh, a book that, that just came out is the, the grants we offer to faculty can also be used to hire students to create graphics and uh, those will be under um, under an agreement whereby the student says that um, their their work is will be openly licensed and freely available and so we're able to um, have that agreement with students to do that uh, and i see you're asking who pays for this right now we're funded through the university libraries we do not have a press on campus there is no university-wide press in virginia or anything like that so it, it is part of the the um open education budget or the vt publishing budget at the university libraries and Dave and Lori, could you speak to that as well? To the, I see a question further above on where the grant money for these types of books and types of projects is coming from at your institutions. Can you also give us a, a brief glimpse on that? Uh, sure. We're not an institution. We're uh, a project. So we are funded by our Ministry of Advanced Education. Uh, to provide support to all 25 uh, public post-secondary institutions in the BC, British Columbia, as well as the private institutions. This is Dave. Um, I'm at a community college. And so the, the project that I was doing for open education was um, approved as a sabbatical application. Um, my college recently received a grant, a small grant, um, that part of which is we're going to be able to use to incentivize faculty to start creating or adopting. Um, so I don't know if that answers that question, but it's a part, I wanna go back to one of Brian's questions. Um, I don't know the, if there's a, a most common uh, format for open education, someone else in this group probably does. Um, but for me, Pressbooks was a really easy choice to make for the platform for what I was using. Um, I liked the visual aspect of it. Um, it was well supported. Um, so big thanks to Hugh and Zoe and Aperva and Liz. Um, that team was fantastic to work with. Um, it was accessible or as accessible as anything that I could find was um, with continual improvements. Um, for accessibility. Um, 
And, and so that was an easy choice. Uh, of the five things that I was looking at to try to sort into the same um, unifying text, three of those were in Pressbooks already. So that made it really easy. Um, one was HTML, but Pressbooks has a, a mechanism or a plugin to be able to, to render that. Um, it didn't come through seamless. It came through without me doing a whole lot of manual labor. Um, and the last one was my own that was previously in Word and entered through a, a similar kind of plugin. It, it stripped uh, all the formatting out and then put in the text. Um, I was at an open education um, conference breakout session where the topic of the session was about those formats. And essentially the message was, please don't do anything in PDF because PDF is, 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 is um, terribly difficult to be able to <laughs> openly adopt. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, for, for, BC, for BC campus, our senior developer, uh, Brad Payne, um, started working with Hugh very early on in our project's life. And it, uh, Pressbooks was chosen as the authoring platform early. So when we were uh, project managing the creation of the first textbooks uh, for the Canadian market, uh, we again were all learning and we insisted that authors work in press books and we did get some pushback on that and we had, well, one author I worked with insisted on working in Word and then we had to get a student assistant to put it into press books. <laughs> so it wasn't ideal, but um, we've continued to support the Pressbooks platform. Uh, we provide webinars. In fact, we had one yesterday morning for British Columbia faculty and staff. On uh, uh, We have both an introductory uh, webinar followed by an intermediate webinar. So we explore the various details and aspects of using Pressbooks for open textbooks specifically. We have a guide that we have written in addition to Pressbooks.com's guide. Um, I'm looking at creating, updating that and creating a second edition because there's so much information coming out. Uh, we invite feedback. We have a support page showing people upgrades, etc. So we've done everything we can to support that platform um, consistently and teach our faculty and staff how to use it. I would agree that the remix um, of PDF is really problematic. And the, actually the book that we remixed from was PDF. So we had to reverse engineer it. It was, it was such a mess. And that was a lot of why I was really interested in working on the, the um, guide for modifying open textbooks was because I had so many problems with, with um, modifying and I wanted to know what are the best practices, what are the the tools, um, what are the formats, and I think what we settled on was uh, releasing things in a structured format. So if it's EPUB, if it's HTML, um, if it's XML, it's something that has um, the structure built into it so that you know what kind of data you're, you're looking at uh, and, and being able to import and export um, in something like Pressbooks really is, is pretty ideal. So for our next version, we'll, we'll see our, um, our university is working with a few different partners. So we're part of the, um, the open textbook uh, publishing pilot and are working with a, uh, a, a vendor there who is um, training us on production processes. We're also partnering with Ubiquity Press and just seeing what do all these, what do these groups do? What kind of support can we get? What, how would we build, how can we build what we need to build and do it in a way that is as, as open as possible, but is as informed as possible. Many of us are coming in without a a publishing background and uh, I think it's pretty common to to not have a publishing background and be starting in open work and and not realizing the complexity. I am going to chime in this is Karen and to build on Anita's comment I think that's the boat that many people find themselves in is what kind of support can we offer our faculty authors, what skill sets are within our organization, 
what kind of scope do we want to offer? And so um, that's one reason why the OTN is trying to develop different flexible pathways. And if you're a member and you kind of want to think these questions through out loud together, I am happy to do that with you. Um, and there are also case studies in our guides of different program profiles that kind of speak to um, the different levels of services that different um, publishing programs at libraries offer. And to um, it really speaks to, I think, the different ways you can promote success you know, within a limited environment. There's not just one way to do this right. There's a lot of different ways, and we're figuring a lot out together. Um, I would like to ask Dave a question related to um, your, your introductory um, spiel, for lack of a better word, and that is you mentioned that you worked on relicensing some contents and um, got them to a more open CC by I think you did this with SUNY. I would love to hear a little bit more about that story because that's that's a fairly common um, question and concern that that is often out there. Yeah, sure. I, uh, honestly, I don't know if it was just happenstance and, and good fortune for me or um, if it might be as easy commonly as it, as it was. But um, I believe, Anita, I was sitting next to you at um, – the OpenStax breakfast at the Open Education Conference, and then sitting on the other side of me was, um, shoot, now I can't remember her name, but um, it'll come to me. Um, but she was doing all things uh, OER for the SUNY system. Yes. Alexis. Alexis, uh, okay. thank yeah. you. Yeah. And um, so I mentioned to Alexis, I said, here's what I'm trying to do. And I said, I almost didn't adopt this SUNY text into what I was trying to put together because I was afraid that it would be too complicated with the licenses, not on my end, but for downstream users to try to figure out what, you know, how, how the licenses fit for which content was what. And, and so I said, have you ever thought about um, relicensing it? And, and much to my surprise, she said, I've been trying to do that for a long time. And I inherited these texts that had these share like and non-commercial licenses, because at the time that they were published and released, they were really concerned about proprietary um, uses for their open texts. And she said, why don't we contact the editor and see what he has to say? And he got back to us pretty quickly and just said, I'm, I'm interested what are the pros and cons? And we laid out, you know, here are the advantages and here are the things that um, you might want to think about before taking the non-commercial license off. Um, within a week, he had decided, I think this is the best way to go. And um, fortunately, again, for me, within about two months uh, before my project was done, they had another version that was relicensed as CC BY. That's great. Yeah, so I, I would call that a victory for the entire open education okay. community. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. it, was, it was just amazing for me to be able to, I, I, I don't feel like I did very much other than ask the question and then it, it just came out roses. <laughs> Thanks for asking. Perhaps you can share those, those persuasive talking points with us. I will do my best. <laughs> Anita, that reminds me um, of your um, comment about fair use conversations and how difficult those were. Could you talk a little bit more about that? Oh, um, yes. So we brought a team member on partway through the process and had long conversations about Creative Commons licenses and uh, I don't know if I was not emphatic enough or quite what happened, but uh, all of a sudden there were these images, there were um, pictures of magazine covers and other things that uh, the citations didn't have open licenses. And so I had to say, wait, um, this might be fair use in some contexts, but because we're sharing with the world and because you're sharing the entire image and because, you know, someone might want mm -hmm. to sell it. Uh, it doesn't have an open license. It's a creative work. It really, I, I can't affirm that being a fair use. And we went back to the original goals of open licensing, share with the world, not just with our students, uh, and um, had to pull those out. 
um, it, yeah. So being really clear about what's allowed and what's not, almost to the point of being annoying, <laughs> 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 um, it, it's really it's really important. I've I had a one of my first projects. Um, decided uh, someone in the project decided to license an image from a commercial vendor which meant that we couldn't share the all of the source files broadly and it has potential de to derail a whole project if someone um, doesn't understand what is uh, what is allowed and what's not um, mm -hmm. fair use I would say fair use with text might be a little bit different because it is commonly you you don't commonly copy a whole chapter you would copy a quote you might copy um, a, a minor part and I'm not an attorney um, <laughs> uh, you would copy a small portion of something and so I think that kind of fair use is less um, in my opinion less dangerous than um, copying an entire image and redistributing the image um, what what Dave said about downstream users and care for downstream users, I think is really important when you add content under fair use that is iffy. Uh, you put other people in a position where they have to do where they should do a fair use analysis and you don't want to do that in openly licensed content. Um, I, the, yes. Related to that, there were a couple things in our book that uh, we could not find alternatives for that were very specific that we requested permission for and the permission is included in our is included in a file on our website that people can request so they can see what exactly they there is permission um, to do I included a clause about the permission being transferable that's something to talk to your legal counsel about to to ask um, what would this what what could what could we do to make sure that other people can use this material um, if they are downstream users and what does that look like I know that's a controversial issue <laughs> there, there are different perspectives on it yes. but that that yes. guiding principle of care for the downstream user I think is a really nice way to frame it yeah yeah Two things I just wanted to jump in and add. There was a question about graphic design. No, I didn't use one. I would, I would love to use one in the future. I think, um, as mentioned in the chat, utilizing student talent um, is is a great way to go. And some of the things that were previously created that I was putting together already had um, images, artwork, photography in there. Um, so I, I debated a little bit about from a consistency standpoint, what I wanted to do with that and um, kind of defaulted just to leave most of the artwork as it was and then later on kind of go back in and see if I can make it more consistent. Um, then the, back to the copy editing, um, I, I would love to be able to have the funding to hire, as Lori said, someone that has the eye for it because absolutely I agree they can catch things that other folks uh, common <laughs> common folks like me can't catch. Um, I didn't have the funding for that, but uh, credit to Rebus when I was trying to figure out how I was going to conduct a peer review. Um, they were incredibly helpful with essentially crowdsourcing uh, the peer review part of it. And, um, and from my perspective, it went really well. It, it didn't cost me anything. I had a lot of eyes um, catching a lot of things and making suggestions to make the work better. Um, so I don't know how scalable that is um, in general for the open community or for specifically for Rebus, but um, for my project, it was fantastic. Thanks, Dave. And we are actually putting together some guides and resources for those um, who are wanting to replicate a similar process on their own on their own projects coming soon. Super. So I'm not sure if there are questions in chat that need to be tended to, but Lori, I wanted to give you um, a chance to talk about what kind of updates will be in the in the guide that Dave found so helpful and and um, anything you want to share about the new release of that guide coming up. Yes, um, so there's a big surprise that I'm not going to reveal. However, I will say uh, what, 
Um, and Karen, you and I have talked about this. So one thing I've done and Karen and I have talked about is I reference um, the OTN authoring guide throughout hours so that people hopefully can get the best of both worlds. Uh, I have folded into it all of our procedures that we learned during those initial phases of hand-holding authors. Um, not, we don't want to be stingy and hiding our secrets. So as well as we could, we added all of that. Uh, I have added uh, templates for contracts, checklists, um, and uh, tried to provide some examples from the books that we have created. So. As I speak, the work is being copy edited and proofread. So we're trying to um, model what we're uh, proselytizing about how an open textbook should be to maintain the quality and, and whatnot. So that will be coming soon, in three weeks, I guess. Super. Yeah. And we will be um, doing the same in referencing a BC Campus guide and our guide. Yes. so that um, there's uh, sharing among the community and sort of easier connection between those resources. Yeah, and you're on my list, Karen, to email you as soon as I'm ready. Okay, good. <laughs> I'm glad I wasn't the one who <laughs> no, no. I, 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 you know, I, I, I get these long lists of things that I'm doing, and it's like, I know that was two or three years ago, but I haven't forgotten, so <laughs> okay. don't worry about it. I look forward to it. Okay. Karen, we do have one more um, comment that just came in in the chat um, from C. Holland. I'm concerned in general that many instructors are not thinking about accessibility as they begin building their OER library. What has your experience been on this front? Well, at BC Campus, my colleague uh, Amanda Coolidge, along with um, Tara Robertson's from Cape Caper, BC, and uh, Sue Doner from Camosun College created the Accessibility Toolkit, which was how long ago was that? Probably three years ago now. And it's actually being revised at this time. Uh, it, is, it is big, um, and it requires yet more time when you're creating uh, books. And in the new revised guide that we have coming out on Valentine's Day, uh, I make sure that that is addressed not just for students with physical and mental challenges, but um, you know, broadening that definition of accessibility to mean anybody. So I always think of when I, I, I was a writer in my previous career and I had two little kids at home. So I had mountains of laundry and dirty dishes and crying children uh, at my feet as I was attempting to write. So that's a form of inaccessibility, is giving uh, adults who are at school um, access to, to uh, education. Um, so anyways, we do try to practice what we preach uh, based on the information in the toolkit and very slowly, because it does take a lot of time, we're going back and uh, retrofitting a lot of our books and once they meet the requirements in the accessibility checklist at the end of that toolkit, we mark it with an accessible flag. So that's what we have done. Claudia, I appreciate that question. Um, and it's something we're thinking about as we're launching the publishing cooperative and our publishing initiatives, um, because we want to be sure that any support we provide includes accessibility and universal design support. And what that looks like, we don't know right now. Um, I'm meeting again with um, Yuta and Jess at OCAD University, um, who are foremost experts in universal design about how we can build that into our cooperative um, publishing experience and training. And we also have an OTN working group um, that's led primarily by instructional designers who are looking at this same question in terms of perhaps instituting um, an accessibility evaluation tool in the Open Textbook Library, which of course includes textbooks from hundreds of different publishers with varying standards and considering, you know, would it make sense to provide an evaluation for each record? Um, what would that look like? What would be involved? So we are actively um, pursuing those questions and, and in the meantime, pointing to different resources, including the BC Campus Accessibility Guide um, for what people are doing now. It, uh, Claudia, asked, uh, that's a great question and it's a concern of mine also. Um, and from my experience, 
Um, again, one of the reasons that I chose Pressbooks was because um, it was as accessible as as any platform that was out there, and and they convinced me that they were making improvements um, with accessibility going forward, which they have done. Um, I was fortunate to have uh, someone on my campus who's an alternative uh, media specialist who was willing to review my text and and along the way educate me about um, many things accessibility that uh, really coincided well with BC's accessibility toolkit. Um, so the one piece of advice or two pieces of advice I would have one I, I encourage you to educate and advocate um, faculty and colleagues who are embarking on these um, going into to creating or adopting um, open educational resources and and let them know about accessibility if, if they don't already. The other is it is so much better and easier to be able to have accessibility built in from the forefront than to try to go back and retrofit it. Um, that's just as painful as mm -hmm. the yeah. <laughs> um, so, conversion. Yeah, yeah. I So Dave, I would agree that the trying to do accessibility at the end just seems like an add-on uh, and that the there are times when push comes to shove and it doesn't get done. Um, and I think that's probably more common um, for a lot of people. So having a, a platform or a system in which that comes is, is built in as an in, intentional design is really critical. Um, that was a big part of why we didn't uh, do our layout in a graphic design software was because uh, because it would be a flat file and it would be a picture of a page and um, what, what we ended up with is is um, you know is functional and works and is fine and is editable and all of those things and will go out of date eventually but the um, screen readers can read it and um, mm -hmm. it's it has mistakes. There are things that are not accessible in the book, but um, we we met a, a low bar, um, and we're hoping to do better. So. Thank you. So we're we're nearing the end of our hour. Liz, are there any other questions you see in the chat we can squeeze in? No. Okay. We're coming to our natural conclusion then. Um, I would like to thank Liz Mays and the Rebus team for organizing office hours. And um, our guests for this topic were Lori Asoff, Dave Dillon, and Anita Walls. Thank you all for sharing your experience. And thanks to everyone who joined the call and asked all of your great questions. Um, we are here to think about these questions and start to answer them together and then to iterate on those answers as um, better possibilities emerge. So it's always great to get lots of different voices. Liz? I would just like to add, I hope you will all join us again for uh, office hours next month. It, the next one is on barriers to open textbook adoption, and that will be February 21st at uh, 2 p.m. PST. And of course, if you get our emails, you will be you will get all the details. So we hope you'll join us then. <laughs>